speak about um, vestibular um, conditions and um, most uh, particular, we're going to home in on vestibular migraine, which would be the most applicable um, to tonight's uh, topic. So, um, so what is migraine? Migraine is basically a reversible neurological condition. So it's where the nerves of the brain just go absolutely wild. And you end up with sort of like a bad hair day inside your head. And as a result of it, you end up with symptoms, which can be sort of simplified down to two areas. One is pain and the other is aura. And all the other symptoms other than pain fall under the aura category. And they include a multitude of symptoms that you would never expect would be associated with migraine. Um, we list the most applicable ones here, and I might just describe them because sometimes patients find it difficult to almost find words to describe the symptoms because we're not brought up being told, and this is vertigo, and this is, so vertigo is basically the illusionary spinning of the environment. So you're sitting there or standing, and lo and behold, you'd swear an oath that the walls were moving. That's vertigo. Dizziness then, the next symptom would be inside the head. So you're looking at the environment and it isn't moving, but inside in your head, there's activity. It might feel like it's spinning or you feel a lightheadedness or you feel like, oh, I could actually pass out here. And it makes you feel very, very vulnerable. Disequilibrium then would be where you're sort of feeling unsteady, that you, you'd be happier almost touching things as you go. If you're walk, walking along a corridor, you'd almost just keep one hand along the wall to stabilize yourself. Spatial disorientation then would be, can you relate to me saying that you're sort of in an environment with people and walls and furniture, but you're not connected to them. You have this almost alien environment perception. A muzzy head is very often experienced by vestibular migraines, and that's where none of the previous sort of more severe symptoms are there, but you have this low grade muzzy head, and it's like a brain fog. And some people would also suffer from nausea and in severe cases, even vomiting. Photophobia, that would be light sensitivity, would be a common symptom uh, for vestibular migraineurs. And um, uh, it would be where on a, a continual basis, they might be light sensitive to bright lights or sunlight or especially fluorescent lighting. But during an episode that uh, light sensitivity is heightened. Um, phonophobia would be where you would have a sound sensitivity that you'd be inclined to say, oh, will you stop talking? You know, especially if the kids are like, rah, 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 rah. or if somebody's playing music, you'd say, would you ever lower that noise down? And that, that's not you being precious. You are literally hearing that sound in an amplified manner. You're seeing that light in an amplified manner. And there's nothing precious about this. This is very real and objective. And um, motion sensitivity is another symptom that a lot of migraineurs would suffer from. Um, not so much in adulthood, maybe, because very often we drive our own car when we're grown up, or we have the luxury of being the front seat passenger. But as a child sitting in the back seat, and very often we may be motion sensitive. So when I would ask patients about uh, any motion sensitivity and they say, no, I would always dig deeper and say, oh, what about as a child? Were you the one that they put by the window because you throw up? And they could so relate to that saying, absolutely. And again, that would be very significant in the assessment of migraine and the diagnosis of it. Um, sinusitis symptoms as well are very often reported and patients would say, uh, no, I have no history of migraine, but I have a long history of sinusitis. And they would describe their sinusitis as being a pain or a pressure on their face, along with tenderness and very often nasal congestion. And they're all symptoms of migraine. And it's quite interesting, actually, they... They did two huge studies on the connection between sinusitis and migraine. 
um, or the differentiation rather. And there were massive studies, like 3,000 in one and two and a half in another, SANS and Summit. And in the studies, they found that nine out of 10 physician diagnosed sinusitis were actually migrainers. That's 90%. So, so often people would come in to me here and they may even book in for acupuncture for sinusitis, but when I assess them, I'm able to, you know, differentiate and diagnose that it actually isn't sinusitis you're suffering from, it's migraine. And very often those people may have suffered for years, had, you know, sinus operations and had taken multiple medications and nasal spray with no... Uh, uh, easing of their symptoms because of a wrong diagnosis. It was migraine all the time. So if it's migraine, you have to treat migraine. And neck stiffness as well is another symptom that people would report. And sometimes they get neck pain or neck ache. And they may not have any head pain. They may just come in with neck pain. And uh, very often people would have maybe seen a multitude of professionals to try and get treatment for their neck pain with, again, no ease of symptoms. The reason being is because the problem is coming from the brain. The brain is insulted, as we were saying. The nerves have gone AWOL and they're causing neck pain. What do you need to do with that? You need to address the migraine. And that's what will help the condition. And um, mood alterations as well, another aspect that um, is affected. So sometimes as migraineurs, you know, you'd get up and you'd be going home for the day. And next thing, the wind would be taken out of your sails and you'd be worth nothing. And you'd be maybe down in yourself or just not as enthusiastic. And again, that's part of migraine aura. And to know that, oh, it's just liberating, knowing that actually I'm not so much of a, you know, a, 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 you know, acute mood alterating person. It's actually a migraine episode I'm, I'm suffering from. Very often people end up suffering from anxiety and depression. Um, and you'd say like, no wonder, Mother Divine, with the multitude of symptoms that they potentially could suffer from, and very often people with these multitude of symptoms have seen many medical professional people, been scanned within an inch of their life and been told, actually, everything is fine. No, your tests are all normal. So they go home with no diagnosis, totally deflated, thinking I definitely am a psycho because everyone is telling me I'm fine, but I'm actually not. not. And as a result, People suffer from anxiety and depression, again, unnecessarily. Um, so it's to be aware of the different symptoms. And migraineurs fall in predominantly to three categories. Some people only suffer from pain. Others suffer from pain and aura. So they might have pain and dizziness, vertigo and so forth. And others suffer from no pain, but just aura. It's called a pain-free migraine. And when I would say to some of my patients, when I diagnose them with vestibular migraine, I can see them so skeptically looking at me going, your one doesn't have a clue. Sure, I told her I have no head pain. And it's because they fall into that category. They've never experienced any head pain, but it's all aura. It's called a pain free migraine, which sounds contradictory. So what happens with vestibular migraine is that the vestibular system is insulted by the migraine and the vestibular system is made up of an apparatus in each ear and their connections to the part of the brain that balance us so when it comes to migraine it's the uh, vestibular part of the brain that's affected migraine is also known as uh, migraine vestibulopathy same name or different name same condition so the vestibular system is insulted and the symptoms, the vestibular symptoms result. So migraine basically insults the vestibular system. So if I was to give you a visual of it, just say that that part of your brain called the vestibular nuclei should be a hand's height above your head. So when things are good, that's where it is. But when you suffer a migraine, it insults the brain and weakens the vestibular system, weakening it into your boots. And thus you end up feeling 
vertigo, dizziness, unsteadiness, and so forth. And then the migraine sort of eases off and the vestibular system sort of gradually recovers. But sometimes it doesn't fully recover. So people are left with like residual low grade symptoms persisting between episodes. And it's because even though the migraine is gone, the storm has passed. The storm damage is still left there. There still is that weakness. It hasn't fully recovered. And this is quite prevalent, like 30% of migrainers suffer from aura. And research has shown that it's the second most common cause of vertigo. I really think that's going to change my experiences, that it is the most common cause of vertigo. I just think it has been underdiagnosed. And that's why the statistics haven't been, you know, uh, shown for it to be the, the first most common uh, just yet. Um, so who gets migraine? In 60% of cases, it'll be, there'll be a family history. So it's one thing I always ask patients, is there any family history of migraine? Sometimes they'll say yes, and other times they'll say no, but I'll ask any family history of vertigo, and they'll say, oh, oh, my mom, my dad, my aunts, my uncles, they all suffered from vertigo. And we must remember that vertigo is a symptom, not a diagnosis. And that's a perception that has been put out there for years because very often if you visit a medical professional with these sort of spinning sensations, you're told, oh, you have vertigo. But being told that is not a diagnosis. It's like coming in to me with a pain in your shoulder. And if I assessed you and I said, John, you know what? You're suffering from pain. You'd say to me, sure, I know I'm suffering from pain, but you're what's causing it. It's pain is to vertigo, um, again, a symptom, not a diagnosis. And that's why it's so important for an accurate diagnosis to be identified. So patients would have a family history of vertigo. And what would I always suspect? If I think they're a migrainer, I'd suspect that they were undiagnosed vestibular migrainers. And it affects all age groups from very young right up to elderly, elderly. I think the youngest child I ever had was, he was only about one and a half, uh, one and a half, two. And um, he was sent in to me because he had a torticollis, which is like a, a tightened muscle of the neck. And um, <clears throat> me, he was seen by a public health nurse and he had this, but the mom, when he came in, she was saying he actually had it when he was with the nurse, but he doesn't have it now. And that's what happens. It comes and goes. And when it happens, I was asking other questions. Then she said, oh, he goes so pale. And sometimes he throws up and oh, all he wants to do is just lie down and not move. He was actually a migrainer. He was suffering from proximal torticollis in infancy. And that's another migraine or a symptom that the muscle contracts and they end up like this. But of course, they have other symptoms as well. And when I dug deeper, the mom, the dad, the aunts and uncles, they were all severe migrainers. So this poor child didn't have a ghost of a chance of escaping. So that would be the youngest I've ever come across. The proportion of women to men, about three to one. Um, so how is it diagnosed? There's no single test for migraine. It's based on a combination of a detailed medical history. You can hear what I'm saying about all the different symptoms patients report family history and so forth and from that you'd always have a very good idea of where you're going after that then it's important to rule out other causes of the symptoms and the most effective way of establishing vestibular migraine is functional vestibular assessment and this is a very objective assessment it's very black and white the system is either working or it isn't and somebody doesn't have to be suffering from a migraine at the time of assessment. They can have a history of it, be totally asymptomatic, but certain things will still show up on the assessment. The assessment would include a combination of gait, which is looking at somebody walking. And very often migrainers walk very unblock. They hold their neck and body very rigid and they head a hundred miles an hour, but nothing is moving. 
And then you get them to walk by moving their heads. So walking back to me, I would get them to turn their heads and they would be swaying over and back and trying to hold on to the wall for stability. They've instinctively learned to not move their head because if they do move it, it makes them unsteady, which is a, a symptom nobody wants to provoke intentionally. So they, they limit. So again, it's very obvious when you see the unsteadiness with walking. Balance as well is very much affected. Um, and we balance with three systems, our vision, our vestibular, like I was saying, and also our joint receptors in our ankles, our knees and our hips. So each of those should be doing their work. And by eliminating, say, like by closing somebody's eyes, it tests the vestibular system far more accurately. And once vestibular migraineurs close their eyes, it's unbelievable the difference because they've become so visually dependent because of the deficit in the vestibular system. When they close their eyes, they lose their balance. And then you can further fine tune it down by testing on a compliant surface, which will take away the ankle and uh, knee and hip joint receptors. So the patient is only left with balancing uh, using their vestibular system on a compliant surface with their eyes closed. And lo and behold, they're inclined to fall on block. And that's where it's very important for us to protect them. But again, to identify objectively where the balance deficit is. There's a test called dynamic visual acuity, which is most informative. It's where you would check the patient's ability to read down on a night chart with their head stationary. And then without changing any other variable, you move their head at two hertz and see how far they can read down. And this is testing their ability to focus with head movement, which is very much compromised in vestibular migraine sufferers and a deficit of three or more lines shows a, a significant weakness in the vestibular system. And again, that's a test that shows up positive for a lot of vestibular migrainers. There's then an ocular motor assessment, which is where we look at the eye movements. There are about 10 different tests, and that's done looking at the eyes directly, but also using infrared goggles, which is, uh, there's a picture of it there on the slide. And um, uh, the goggles take away fixation. So the patient is actually in darkness. And lots of patients say, okay, let's go gaming. And um, so they're in complete darkness, but I'm able to see their eyes on the screen. And again, that tells me a lot because when you take away fixation, you're able to home in on the vestibular system more accurately. And finally, we would always do positional testing. This is to rule out other pathologies, which are predominantly in the inner ear. Um, and uh, if these were positive, they would, call they would cause vestibular uh, symptoms like vertigo and, and so forth. So again, it's to rule out everything else so you can be more comfortable in confirming the vestibular migraine diagnosis. So you get your diagnosis and how is it treated? Well, really it's treated in two ways. One is we need to stop the migraine from occurring. Do you remember we were saying a while ago that migraine is a reversible neurological condition. So the nerves go wild, affecting this vestibular nuclei, pushing it into your boots. So if the vestibular nuclei is up here, we need to stop the migraine from occurring. We need to stop it from insulting that. And that's the most important first starting point. If it does happen, you suffer a vestibular migraine, you end up with vestibular weakness, it recovers to a certain degree, but you need to make full recovery. That's where a vestibular rehabilitation therapy comes in then. Not during a migraine, but once the migraine is gone. And it's an exercise based program, which basically recalibrates the vestibular system, pushing it back up. So patients make a full and complete recovery between episodes. And it's very important for patients to understand that you don't cure a migrainer, you diagnose and then you teach them how to manage it going forwards. And that management is about avoiding the triggers. And then if it does happen, 
at least then it isn't a train smash once you get the diagnosis because before the diagnosis you're like oh here it is again and you're you're sort of almost heading into weeks of a miserable quality of life again once you get the diagnosis you'll be able to identify what caused it you might end up being able to say oh you know what i had a glass of red wine chinese chocolate last night i stayed up all all night and now I'm suffering a migraine. You'll be able to identify the trigger, what caused it, and then avoid that trigger going forwards in order to minimize recurrence again. And it's all about managing it going forwards. These five main triggers for migraine, emotional, environmental, lifestyle, hormonal, and diet. The first and most prevalent one is emotional. And I see this time and time again, so many people, I think more so in the last number of years, even pre-COVID, we just found life was getting so busy for people with technology and demands made and expectations and self-expectations, people thinking I must do, 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 do and achieve, achieve, achieve. And then COVID hit, which has further compounded everything and heightened stress and anxiety. So it is so important that we really look after ourselves and that we look after each other and that we realize a good day isn't achieving things. A good day is taking care of what you can do and understanding what can't get done today because tomorrow is another day and surviving that day in a balanced way to make sure that we look after our mind, our body and our spirit. We feed our mind with knowledge and maybe a bit of gossip and a movie and some uh, information we look after our body with food and exercise and again to have quiet time to allow our spirit to be nourished um along with uh, so you the emotional environmentally then to avoid the environmental triggers avoid uh being exposed to light in an excessive manner and this varies with ver with every individual some people will come in wearing you know the bono glasses all the time and they need that because they are so light sensitive and i have to you know turn off the lights and make sure that i take them to a dark part of the the clinic and again that's not them being precious they literally see light like a floodlight uh into their eyes so it's to avoid overexposure, wearing polarized sunglasses and polarized now aren't Polaroid where you have to spend like a couple of hundred euro. You get polarized glasses in any of the, the, the stores. You pick them up for a couple of euro. And I would always recommend if you are light sensitive to have them everywhere, have a, a set in your bag, a set in your pocket, one in the car, one by the back door. So when you go out in the garden and so forth, to again manage your migraine positively wear a peaked cap if the sun is shining and avoid fluorescent lighting because that's a known trigger when it comes to smells avoid strong smells as best you can and um, sound sensitivity avoid them if you can but again now not to be fanatical not be like oh i can't go there because i might end up with a migraine Oh, we need to have a little bit of get on with life as well. So not to become fanatical about what I'm saying, but just to take it on board in a practical way. Um, use earplugs if it's an unavoidable, you know, noise exposure. And weather changes are a huge factor. Uh, so often patients uh, say to me that they feel like they're a barometer. They know when there's increased atmospheric pressure without having to look at the news at all. And um, lifestyle, very important to maintain a regular sleep pattern. That is crucial, as it is for all of us. You know, the way if, if we lose sleep for whatever reason, because we have a new baby in the house, or we're stressed, or we're upset, or a loved one is sick, she'll be treating Michaela as a result of it. Migraineurs can't cope with it at all. And again, not because they're precious people, it's because their bodies just say, enough. I need my sleep. So to be careful about that lack of sleep or even oversleeping is uh, important to avoid. Migraineers do best with routine. So to be routine about eating, have breakfast, lunch and supper. Don't like skip lunch and then try and make up in the afternoon because your goose will be cooked. You'll feel awful. Or if you're meeting somebody for dinner, 
as we used to do pre-COVID, but we'll be looking forward to it again. But if you're meeting somebody for dinner, like go fast for the day, because by the time you get to dinner, you'll be feeling so awful all you want to do is go home. So nibble away and make sure that you don't fast. So eat regularly, exercise regularly. That is hugely important. We should all be walking for at least 30 minutes a day, but an hour if we're able for it. The difference, simple things like that can make, <clears throat> pardon me, when you walk, we release endorphins and caffeines, which are those feel good hormones, which will de-stress us, allow us to sort of um, see the wood for the trees and come back in a more energized, you know, with a more energized approach. So very important exercise. And as I was saying, sleep, nicotine to be avoided. If you feel, oh, I can't give up cigarettes just now, well, then I'd say cut them down. Every time you have one, just say, OK, this is my last one now for whatever, an hour or a day or whatever. Just minimize them as much you can. Hormonal, we could speak for a month about this. And there is a hormonal uh, um, link with migraine sufferers. Um, with regard to the oral contraceptive pill, very often it's exogenous estrogen not to be taking estrogen from the outside sometimes that can be a trigger um sometimes you need a little bit of estrogen to be given to you in order to avoid a migraine so this is very much an individual thing managed by your your doctor puberty as well can be a trigger menopause at certain times of the menstrual cycle and pregnancy some people their migraines abate and others their migraines go mad during pregnancy. Again, very individual. When it comes to diet, there are volumes of books written about this. And again, not to be fanatical. Don't be like, oh, checking everything all the time in case there might be something in there that I can't have because you drive yourself mad. That'll stress you, which will trigger the migraine. So just very calmly try to identify maybe what is triggering your migraines. Regular meals is very important, a very simple thing. And to make sure that we you eat every eight hours. So usually we wouldn't be avoiding food for eight hours during the day, but certainly when we sleep. And that's why it's important to have a snack before you go to bed. Otherwise, you could wake up in the morning hypoglycemic with a migraine. Avoid dehydration. Make sure you never get thirsty. If you get thirsty, you're already dehydrated. So make sure you drink a couple of pints of water every day. Um, and keeping a diary is great. It's, it's going to be a great help to you to identify your triggers, but also a great help uh, to medical professionals that will be looking after you. There's a paper copy. The Migraine Association have an absolutely wonderful one. And there's other ones like Migraine Buddy and Deirdre can also let you know of other ones that would be available. So in summary, when it comes to diet, we call them the six C's. Caffeine cheese, red wine, a clarinet, citrus, chocolate, and MSG, which we call Chinese just for the sake of the seas. Um, MSG, which would be in anything that's, you know, really tasty, like the coating on Pringles and soya sauce, and anything that has that really tasty bite to be avoided. Sometimes, again, like you will end up having the glass of red wine and the Chinese and the chocolate cake and the cup of coffee, and you'll feel miserable the following day. But half the time you might end up saying, you know what, it was worth it. I really enjoyed last night. So again, it's about living life as well. So my good triggers always remember are accumulative. You don't just have a cup of coffee and end up with a migraine, but you might get stressed about something, lose the night's sleep, skip breakfast, grab a coffee, and then your goose is cooked. You have your migraine because you've just not looked after yourself. So it's about not being fanatical, but just being sensible about looking after yourself. If it does happen and you end up suffering from the uh, migraine, the key thing is to rest. Try and identify what caused it. If you're hungry, eat. If you're thirsty, drink. If you're stressed, de-stress. Slow everything down. And then when you come out after the migraine, sometimes you might feel okay. Other times you may, may feel quite washed out and you might need that day to recover. And then the following day, you get going on your exercises. And when you initially are diagnosed and you do vestibular rehabilitation, you're taking a long a journey of 
a systematic exercise based program, which is tailor made to each individual to recalibrate the vestibular system to get it from here back up to here. And it's very important that whatever you're instructed in, that you make a migraine file and you keep all that information, because once your system is fully recalibrated, you'll then be discharged. But of course, that doesn't exempt you from getting another migraine episode a day or a week or a month or a year later. Well, what it does do is it allows you to be independent in managing it going forwards. So you don't need to go back to the physio every time you get a migraine. You know how to manage it. You rest, you identify the trigger, resolve it. And then when you're feeling up to it, you get back to doing your exercises again to recalibrate it. And vestibular rehab is a very evidence-based practice. It's so highly researched. It's unbelievable the amount of research that has gone into it. It's absolutely brilliant. It's now a case of implementing that research into people's lives to make that difference. And it comes down to accurate diagnosis. I can't stress that enough. That is the most important aspect for management of any condition and including migraine. And vestibular migraineurs very often avoid head movements because you can imagine when you suffer a vestibular migraine, you have you know, vertigo, dizziness and so forth. So when it goes and you go to move your head, woo, you feel that bit dizzy. So what's the instinctive thing to do? I'm not gonna move my head anymore. So that's why they come in walking on block, not moving. And vestibular rehab is all about movement because there's two types of dizziness. And this now is really, really important. And it's one of the most important take home messages if you're ever diagnosed with vestibular migraine. There's a bad dizziness and a good dizziness. A bad dizziness is when a vestibular migraine occurs. So you're there in the kitchen or you're at work and you're doing exactly what you were doing five minutes earlier, but now you're feeling dizzy for no apparent reason. It's a bad dizziness, it's a vestibular migraine. A good dizziness, on the other hand, is the migraine is gone, you're up, you, you stand up, you feel okay, you go to move and whoa, you feel dizzy. That's a good dizziness because what's happening there is as you move, your vestibular system is trying to recalibrate itself, but it has to be exposed to movement in order to recalibrate itself. So if you're not moving, you're not giving it the opportunity to recalibrate. So that's why you need to end up doing vestibular rehab in order to move. You can't say to a dizzy patient, oh, just go move there, girl. Sure. That, that's totally non-informative. You have to instruct the patient to move in a systematic manner that is tailor-made to each individual patient. And so these movements would include a lot of head and eye movements. So you might get the patient to say, focus on the target while they move their head. And as they get dizzy, they'd love to stop. But once they understand that actually, as I'm doing this and I'm now getting dizzy, this is recalibrating my vestibular system. This is a good dizziness. They'll find that the more they do that, the less dizzy they'll be because their vestibular system is recalibrating. It's been given the opportunity to become normal again. And that is key to recovery. So they might look at a target and move. They might end up moving their head and their eyes together. They might end up throwing a ball, depending on what level of rehab is necessary. So provoking dizziness would be like provoking breathlessness if you were trying to get cardiovascularly fit. You know, if you went for a jog and every time you started to feel breathless, you stopped. She should never get fit. You have to drive on through that breathlessness and the fitter you become, the less breathless you become. Same with this. The fitter your vestibular system is, the less dizziness you'll, you'll experience. Balance training as well is very important. And balance is all about pushing it to the limit so you might get somebody that you know can balance with their two feet together with their eyes open but when they close their eyes they're having to you know readjust all the time that's good because what's happening there is they're forcing their system 
to recalibrate. And while the response and reaction of the body might be extreme like this initially, within a, a, a period, a couple of days or weeks, they'll end up being stationary like this, doing the same balance uh, activity of standing with their feet together, eyes closed, their body is still responding, but it's fine tuned. And that's what vestibular rehab is about. So you're all the time trying to push the patient to the next level. Exposure therapy as well. Very often migraineurs are challenged in busy environments. So supermarkets with uh, shiny floors and fluorescent lighting and shelves stocked with multiple products, different colors and shapes and so forth. So they find it very challenging when they go into that environment. So what do they do? They don't go in. They get somebody else to do their grocery shopping, pardon me, and as a result then their whole quality of life deteriorates. And that's where exposure therapy is important to encourage the person to go into that challenging environment but again, in a systematic manner. So they might go in initially with the trolley accompanied by somebody for five minutes, walk up and down and come out. And that's a fantastic achievement for some people. And then they extend the duration and they might actually do some shopping and then they might leave your man at home and go the next time by themselves. And then they might actually try it without the trolley and bit by bit, having exposed themselves, the whole body desensitizes and lo and behold, they're back to quality of life and to be able to go shopping, uh, which is great for anyone, um, says the worst shopper in the world. Like, I actually don't like shopping. But um, exposure therapy and finally, the home exercise programs are very much tailor made to each individual. Um, and it varies with everyone with their, you know, with, with their condition, their symptoms, their approach to it and their age and so forth. And so let's see, what are the two top tips that I'd love you to take home tonight? One is try and avoid migraine triggers. Imagine your vestibular nuclei, you want to avoid that being pushed in. So take stock with vestibular migraines. And the second thing is to move. Don't be stationary, don't give into it. Bite the dog that bit you by moving.